Hello, and welcome back to the main stage here at Lending 3.0. Right now, we are going to talk about data and decisions powered by data and its role in the next generation of lending. Uh, and we have a really great panel here for you today. So I'm going to introduce them very quickly, and then I'm going to start in with our questions. So we've got Yaron Shoshani of EasyBob, uh, Tom Renwick of Adam Bank, Gareth Rumsey of Thin Cats and Andy Piggott from Metro Bank. So we've got a nice mix of tech and bank here on our panel. So we'll have a really great discussion. So welcome, guys. So, of course, we're going to talk about data. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about the evolution of lending. And there's been a lot of great sessions here today. So I really want to ask all of you uh, as kind of an introductory question. Um, you know, when you're looking at the changing needs of society and digital product offerings that alter customer demands, you know, we're, we're living in the age of open finance. Uh, everyone's living in the age of a global pandemic, which is changing a lot and accelerating a lot of progress. Um, has data kind of kept pace with all of these changes that are, are, are coming around us right now? I mean, you know, what talks about data quality and sourcing always come into the mix whenever whenever people talk about the role data plays in in in, in systems and analytics so i'm really going to start um with andy from uh, metro bank um is the data we're using now has it is it up to scratch has it kept pace with all the massive changes that we're living through right now thanks very much liz um, and thanks for having me on the panel today um to answer your question, I think data has come a long way recently um, and it's evolved significantly. What I would say is not necessarily kept pace in to the same extent is the insight associated with that data. Um, what I mean by that is there is obviously a huge amount of data out there that can be captured now and now more than more than ever before. So open banking, open finance, as you talked about, is a is a great example of that. Um, the current account turnover data that we can get from credit reference credit reference agencies and so on, I think is is a great step forward. Um, and I think the industry is trying to utilize that data to make more effective decisions. Um, but if you look at the majority of lending that's done in the market still today, it's generally just the same data as before or new data going into the same old processes. So, um, human decisioning, manual processes that don't necessarily uh, really properly leverage the insights that could be generated from that from that data. Um, and it does feel like there's, there's a real opportunity for us to, um, to change things and come up with propositions utilizing that data to make much more, more customer centric. Mm. No, I think that's a really good point. We'll probably get into that a bit later, you know, whether it's either old data or old systems. So I'm going to move on to Gareth now. Um, it's the data, you know, has the data kept pace with, with everything that, that's going on in the industry right at the moment? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd really echo what, what Andy said. I think the if, if, if you, you probably all heard statistics like uh, the fact that 90% of the data in the world has been created in the last two years. So I don't think you can really argue that data isn't keeping pace with, with the speed of change elsewhere. But the problem with that is that um, you need time to, to really wallow in the data, to understand it and to drive those insights, as Andy was saying. You can't simply take new data, whether that's um, current account turnover data provided by credit reference agencies, whether it's open data, and just assume that you can drop it into whether it's existing models or new models without having spent the time to, to properly understand the provenance of it, understand the nuances of it. You know, I've been using filed account data from companies house for 20 years and I still discover new things about it on a sort of a weekly basis. So I, I think it's it's not the data itself that's that's struggling to keep pace. It's simply the you you need time to to really wallow in that data to be able to use it to its full effect. So I'm going to move on to Yaron now for our, our you know if you can sort of add your add your comment to our introductory question about about whether data is really is really keeping pace with with the lending industry and what it's going through. Thank you, Liz. So I, I will say that it's it's not just the data, it's how real time is the data. And I think that this is the the main difference of what we're trying to see and look right now on, on, on the market. Um, we understand that the traditional data today is not good enough. And, and we're looking for up-to-date information, online information, something that can really reflect um, 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 the, the environment today. 
So I think, yes, there are more, much more data sources that we can consume, much more data that we can get into, 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 um, into analytic systems. Um, but I think that the quality of the data is still under question. And I'm, I'm asking myself if we have enough real-time data that can really help mm. us and support us when we need to take decisions. Yeah, no, I mean, of all of your answers are really going to, we're going to fill out in the in the rest of our, our discussion, but sort of uh, keeping with this sort of opening, opening broad question, I'm going to, I'm going to go finally to Tom, you know, what what is your view on, on how data is keeping pace with the, with the changes and the evolution in business and technology we're going through right now? Yeah, I, I think it's done more than just keep pace. I think it's instigated a lot of the changes. Um, I think if we look at um, traditional bank ownership, and I use kind of ownership in inverted commas of, of customer data, um, you know, historically that's given large incumbent banks um, a competitive advantage in terms of pricing and, and risk scoring. You know, historically, they could observe um, much better uh, income, cash flow, you know, look at the existing loan performance than, than other lenders. And we've seen, I think, particularly, you know, in small business lending, some of the data asymmetries between um, uh, lenders and would-be borrowers being particularly acute. I mean, if we look at the last 12 months, which have been, you know, undoubtedly challenging, as I'm sure we'll come to discuss in, in time, you know, basing a credit decision based on you know, statutory annual accounts now is relying on what's reprehensibly out-of-date data. Um, I echo the, you know, the previous comments there that we need real-time data-driven decision-making um, in times like this. We're starting to see that with, with initiatives like open banking. Um, mm. So, you know, faster, better credit decisions, um, mining real-time uh, data to derive income and affordability um, if you have the, the systems and processes to, um, to utilize it. So I wanted to move the conversation a little before we get into some, you know, uh, technical issues, but more of a sort of society question. You know, whenever people talk about you know, real-time decisioning and, and, and quicker decisioning um, uh, processes, um, you know, and, and, and looking at, at how better data sets and, and open, open banking and open finance has kind of changed the way uh, we as businesses and people uh, interact with financial services. What's often brought up is that these advances are bringing a more inclusive lending environment, you know, offering lending and credit uh, to more tailored to people's lives or or to, you know, more reflective of their true risk profile. Um, I, I sometimes get a bit cynical, a bit skeptical and thinking, has that actually happened? You know, this more inclusive lending environment because we now have better data sets and real-time analytics and, and open finance. So I'm, I'm going to go to, to, to Yaron first. You know, are, are we seeing a more inclusive lending environment because because of these advancements? So um, I, I would say the answer is yes. I think that it's all about expectation, about the fact that, you know, the, the, the end user today are expecting something which is a bit more tailored, a bit more personalized. Uh, and, and the system are moving within the same direction and they are trying to um, to take the data and use the data in order to offer something which is really tailored to the need of the of the business to the really to the need of the of the of the end user and um, I think that from the end user perspective people are ex expecting to this to this experience you know they are used to to Netflix and to and to to Amazon and and the experience is much more tailored and personalized and fast and quick and, and very easy to understand what are you doing and why you are doing it. So um, I think that if you look on the, the movement within the within the um, within the different system, a different solution today, you can see that um, this is exactly what um, um, the banks are trying to do and, and the alternative vendors are trying to do is to take every request and every demand and try to give the best solution for each demand. Excellent. So, Tom, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to you because I know Adam Bank is a is a, a digital bank, you know, and and you know, are, are you seeing are you seeing a move towards a more inclusive lending environment? Oh, uh, y yes and no. I think you know, the, the kind of the adage is, isn't it, that um, the less information you know about something, the more you have to price in the risk of, of the unknowns. And I think you know we're getting to a place where you know a broader picture of um, an applicant's risk profile is enabling lenders to um, Increase acceptance rates, reduce false negatives, and you know allow in many cases for um, an, a better assessment of finfile applicants and give some of the open data sources. Yeah. In that regard, yeah, I'm, I'm confident that there'll be a broader access to the kind of financial ecosystem. However, I think you, you're equally right to be cynical. You know, there are still one and a half million or so um, adults in the UK that have no current account or e-money account. 
um, you know, 10 million or so that have um, low digital capabilities. So as we talk, you know, as we do will today about um, new innovative types of unstructured data, machine learning, NLP, you know, we can get you know, um, very self-absorbed. Um, so it's definitely possible that you know, the nature of digital financial exclusion is exacerbated by um, uh, some of the changes that we're seeing. And we need to ask, you know, what are the unintended consequences um, for people that aren't in a position to share the data or, or don't want to? Um, you know, in the future, I think possibly owing to the fact you'll see reduction to, in cost of serving um, these businesses, and typically it's been a really high cost to serve industry. Um, customers that are willing to perhaps share a combination of those digital and real-time um, source of data can benefit from more fuel pricing. Um, there are already some lenders in the market, for example, that offer cash back for sharing open banking data. So it's a really, really fine line to tread. Yeah, no, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm going to move. I'm going to move to Gareth now. Um, you know, with 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 all we're seeing, especially real time and really sort of shorter decision uh, timelines, are, are are we seeing are we seeing a broader, more inclusive uh, lending environment? What what are you seeing, Gareth? I think there's <clears throat> there's two aspects, I guess, to inclusivity. One is um, the one that, that Tom was just talking about, which is uh, in in the pre-digital world, if you like, that there was a whole raft of credit invisibles, you know, people as consumers as individuals and small businesses that hadn't filed any accounts yet where there was nothing known about them and they were basically excluded from um, from lending products um, almost systemically. And I think, you know, the, the, the move to, um, to digital has definitely helped that. Uh, you know, in my old role at Experian, um, you know, we were very actively trying to reduce the, the thin file population. Um, within FinCats, we don't really have that kind of issue in the sense that our borrowers are mid-market firms, so that there, there aren't any thin file customers. They're not credit invisible, that they are out there, they're visible. But I think there is still a population of um, underserved businesses, if you like. Uh, and I think that will, that, will con that will always be the case. Whatever, whatever you put in place, there will always be populations that for whatever reason drop out uh, and, and there aren't products which are perfectly suited or tailored to them. So we find in particular that, 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 we, that the banks are maybe not fully serving the growth business population, businesses who are whose growth is maybe um, eating into their profits, cannibalizing their balance sheet, um, businesses that don't have any tangible lendable assets. So uh, you're, you're essentially lending against future cash flows. Again, this, this can be really tough for, um, if you like, the, the more traditional banks to um, to lend against. So I think it's I think there is an increase in, in inclusivity, but it's there's still there's still more to be done. Yeah, so Andy, the reason why I left I left you last uh, to answer this question is, you know, Metro Bank is of course has a physical presence on on the high street. It's it's almost on this panel could be the the, the traditional bank, although it doesn't have uh, hundreds of years behind it. You know, are you seeing have, have you seen a change with with business customers and 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 having a more a more inclusive lending environment? So I think theoretically, this is absolutely the direction the industry should be going in, and I think we are going in that direction but I think we're still quite a long way from really realizing that and that's across both uh, lenders with, with physical presence and, and purely digital lenders and, and I think it's also true across both personal consumers and business customers as well clearly getting a broader set of data should allow you to get comfortable lending to customers that you, you weren't comfortable lending to um, before and um, I do think though at the moment and particularly and I'm sure this won't be the last time today we talk about the impact of COVID. I think that has increased the, the level of nervousness um, among lenders. Um, and so I think there is a, an increased focus on managing credit risk exposure, which tends to default back to what is known and what has been proven to be effective at um, discriminating for risk in, in the past, e even if, uh, and I might come back to this later, e even if that's not necessarily the best guide to what's going to happen in the future, I think um, when when there is in heightened nervousness about, um, uh, about the broader economic environment, the willingness to, to take a risk on new data sources to be more inclusive is perhaps lessened. I think that's something that the, uh, the industry needs to overcome quite quickly though. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to further the conversation, um, talking about you know using this data this data to really tailor a personalized service, especially for for businesses. And I wanted to maybe have a discussion about what that really means 
to have a, a personalized service. So I'm, I'm going to go to Tom because I know in your your last answer you talked about you know how much information do you need uh, to sort of measure that risk and calculate that risk. So Tom, you know how do you what does it mean to offer to use this data to offer a, a tailored lending service to businesses? Yeah, I think it's, it's worth stepping back for a second. I think you know, if you look um, at the market today, you know, the, the vast majority, I think you know, the CMA back in 2015 and 16 reported that about 75% of businesses go to their, their primary business credit account provider first when looking for a loan. And there's, there's three reasons for that. You know, um, the importance of the existing relationship is one, um, uh, the perceived time and effort of, of applying elsewhere, but, but perhaps most importantly, this belief that their business current program provider um, possesses a greater understanding of their financial history. Um, and so I think it, it some more things that we're looking to do is, and it goes to the heart of our successful um, PCR award, is about reimagining the provision. Um, so let's move it away from, from product, product push towards more contextualized, personalized smart learning. So that's offering um, responsible and informed solutions at the right time. Um, and to do that, we're, we're placing at the heart of our kind of uh, business propositions, integration of data, um, of open banking and management account information in particular. Um, we're looking to categorize this, we're looking to enrich this, we're looking to pay that back to the customer. I think particularly when you look at, at last week's FCA announcement, their review of the 90-day um, AISP uh, reauthentication, that's a significant opportunity to overcome some of the data issues that have plagued the industry for a while. Um, but you've got to earn the right to have that data. You need to be a, a kind of fair value exchange with the customer. That's why we're looking to, to provide it back to them. But if you have that kind of privileged access to data, um, if you have access to more um, typically unstructured data, it helps us better understand customers. And that ability to understand, to continue to monitor the needs, to preempt borrowing, um, and to react in, in real time to changes in behavior um, with actionable nudges, with personalized solutions in the moment, I think is where the industry needs to go into um, dynamic personalized products. Um, you know, we're looking at um, products that are tailored towards small business cash flow, you know, a repayment schedule that beckons out of the um, income profile of that business. Uh, and all these things are, are eminently possible, um, they just haven't been done before. Yeah, I mean, excellent. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to move on to Andy now because I, I liked when you spoke earlier about sort of this this period of anxiety that we're in right now. But you know, sort of moving on from that, um, in in creating these personalized services, you know, how how does a bank work with that, and and how do they how do they offer a tailored services to business? Yeah, I, I think uh, agree with a lot of what Tom was um, saying just then. I think you know more granular data should genuinely enable you to properly understand a customer's needs um, much more than the, the, the historical way of uh, understanding customers um, has been, um, as well as understanding the risk that you're taking in lending to those customers. Um, so transactional data, I think, is a great example of what could be used to uh, get, get a much greater insight into um, a customer's need and, uh, and a customer's risk profile. So, you know, the, their eBay or Amazon marketplace um, transaction history, I think, is a really useful insight to understand more about consumer spending habits to, to generate those properly targeted propositions. Um, I think the other really exciting opportunity is about allowing lenders to become more proactive as well. So rather than waiting for a customer to come to you to say, um, please, can I have a loan? Um, it, we should be able to anticipate when a customer might require a, a finance product, you know, often before they know it themselves. Um, you, you obviously need to be quite careful with that. Um, it, it could come across as a bit sort of big brotherish if um, if you're 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 you're, prop, you're really getting in ahead of uh, customers coming to you about it. But I think as long as it is genuinely used to help customers, it should be a really positive thing as as long as it's um, positioned properly. So um, yeah, that that kind of additional transactional level data to enable us to get on the front foot to help customers not necessarily with a sort of traditional product set but with a, a broad and more innovative product set proactively mm -hmm. i think could be could be game changing yeah, I'm, I'm going to move on and maybe maybe to ask Gareth because I know I know that Thincats, you know, they work with like, sort of mid mid-sized um, businesses. You know, are, are are you seeing that change? Are you seeing that change with uh, reacting to spit the specific needs uh, and sort of and redetermining 
uh, the credit worthiness and, and risk profile of, of these businesses in, the, in, in, in this space? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the reacting to, to, the, to the business's needs, it's something that we've always done. It's, it's just a nature that um, have relationships. You know, we're, we're not trying to uh, oh. thousands of businesses. We are lending to hundreds of businesses um, and, and have proper relationships with, with each of them. We have our, our business development managers who are physically out seeing those clients. We have the underwriting team. Yeah, you know, look into uh, the, the the full um, financial um, forecasting of, of that business. So, I, I think in terms of tailoring uh, the relationship, but I think in terms of the the, the booking, um, rather than just relying on historical data and saying this business been able to make its repayments and is it willing to make repayments, move the future, future looking, will it be able to make repayments in the future? Okay, excellent. Um, excellent, but very good. We, we had a little bit of technical technical issues with you and on, uh, on that, but I think we, we got most, we got most of, uh, most of what you said. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that you're, you're better heard for the, for the next question. Um, but I'm going to maybe move on to Yaren. I mean, especially with with the customers that that EasyBub works with. I mean, are, are we seeing um, you know a, a change, especially in the SME space, on what determines creditworthiness? So yeah, the answer is yes. I think that again, as as exactly as Andy said, we are looking for um, for more um, information, and more data. I even will call it even as an ecosystem. It's, it means that you don't need to stand and to think about the bank as a standalone entity that someone just get in and, 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 and look for, you know, some kind of financial product. And exactly as Andy said, it's more about identifying the needs, looking into um, new data sources that were not used before. Again, eBay, Amazon, um, information that can help you to understand um, the business better. And I think that the, on the other side, what is also important is a flexible system. It means that you know you, you can you, you need something that can actually get the information, but can actually react to the data, can change the policy, can change um, the result, can change the the risk appetite, can change the risk profile. And 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 when you have the right system in place and you have the right data sources that can represent um, um, the business, then together you can actually lead in some, something much more personalized. You can see in many in many systems today, there's like a new layer of uh, machine learning and AI that can actually observe a lot of information, thousands of data points that they can be organized in a very easy way. And based on that, yeah, actually to offer uh, the best offer for the end user. Um, again, if I'm looking now on our clients, and, and again, one of our clients is sitting in this, in this panel today, um, um, I think that um, the demand from the fintech today is to be, is to be flexible, is to give uh, the bank, the flexibility in it in order to react fast to these new data sources, to these new demands from the market. Excellent. Um, so I wanted to move on a little bit about, and, and some of you have, have, have touched on this a bit, um, about specific pain points um, for the SME sector, you know, in, in regards to lending, you know, cash flow, um, you know, changes in, in, in business climate, um, you know, throughout the year, uh, you know, seasonal businesses. So maybe we can get sort of a, an idea of what are some of the biggest pain points you are seeing in this sector when when it comes to loans and, and credit and lending. So I'll, I'll I'll start with Andy with this. What 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 are you seeing from your from your business banking clients? So cash flow that you identified, I think, is a really a really critical one, um, and I think. The, the level of understanding of customers sometimes around how to manage that cash flow and what products can can help uh, manage that is not sometimes there. And that's not customer's fault. I think that's the the industry uh, has a, a an opportunity to step up on, on sort of the education of uh, around what those products can be used for. Um, and indeed the, the, the sort of simplicity of the, the products that, that could be on offer to um, to help customers ma manage that cash flow. Um, I think it's also 
it's hard to talk about this without thinking about the impact of COVID again, um, because I think it's brought this as a specific pain point right to the fore for, for many customers. So the, the, even customers who may be used to dealing with volatility and cash flow on a seasonal basis, there's been a, a whole extra layer of volatility and cash flow over the last last 12 months with the, the various lockdowns and so on. And I think that's that's meant it's been incredibly difficult for customers to um, to to properly manage their their cash flow um, and therefore also for lenders to to assess that as well. Um, it, again, you know, we would typically look at historical cash flow performance as a guide to future performance, but there's a question about how relevant that really is um, in uh, in the future, given given the significant changes to the environment. Yeah, I'm going to stay with you for a bit because I wanted to have a bit of a follow up question, um, Andy, which sort of combines my next question. You know, all of what you mentioned that that journey needs to be digitized in some way. You know, what are what are the barriers to digitize? On the customer side. Um, so a, c a couple of thoughts on that. One is, um, I guess, the extent to which digitization and automation are are interchangeable, and I don't think they are. I say I don't think digital necessarily means automated at every um, every step of the process. There are parts of the process which make eminent sense to have sort of straight through. Um, uh, automated uh, dig digital journeys in place, but there are other parts where it's not necessarily desirable. Um, and I think to bring that to life, the, the other point on this is, if I take fraud as an example, um, and the experience we've had through the bounce back loans scheme um, that we've participated in uh, over the last last few uh, few months. Um, our aim has been to have a really straight through digital process. And for the vast majority of the, uh, the process, we've achieved that. And that's, that's resulted in some you know, fast, fast outcomes for customers. But, but fraud is a really difficult one. You're always going to get some bad guys out there who are going to try and take advantage of, uh, of any process. And sometimes there is no substitute for having a, a, a human review of some of the um, some of the, the transactions before before money goes out the door. So I think I think fraud is a specific area that I would. But uh, mm. yes, we should absolutely be looking at opportunities to make it as efficient as possible. But um, but fully automating, digitizing that um, is risky. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to to Yaren now. I mean, maybe to to go back to that earlier point about um, what are the pain points that you're seeing in in the SME market. Um, you know, and, and what are some of the barriers to digitizing that that journey? So, so Yaren, what what are some of the pain points you're seeing? So, I, I, I will start with something which is much more basic, which is I'm starting with with the accessibility. It's the, for example, the the, the working hours. You know, I'm, I'm running a, a small business. It's very difficult for me to come to the bank and to provide all the information that I need. I really look for something that can really operate um, the best it can. You know, over weekends, over nights. Um, I can tell you that one of the um, the pain point is, is going to be the, the answer, how fast I'm getting the answer. And um, the expectation is to get the answer immediately. And I can tell you that based on our experience that people are willing to pay more. You know, you can increase the interest if you can give them just the answer in the speed they're expecting to get it because they need the money now, um, especially when you talk about working capital. So I, I will say that, um, again, based on our data, by the way, people um, for small businesses are applying for loan over lunchtime, evening, weekends. And this is the expectation. I think that the accessibility is very important for them. Second, I think they're looking for, um, for a way um, to demonstrate the business performance. They want to, to demonstrate in a very easy way um, um, of to provide all the needed information in a very easy way, and they're looking for something that is going to make it easier for them over mobile, over the web. Um, and as I said, they are willing to pay a bit more for that. This is based on our experience. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to to, to Tom now from um, from Adam Bank. You know, for for so for the clients that that you're working with, we, what are what are what are some of their biggest complaints? Where 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 is their biggest pain happening? Um, I think there's a lot to be said about um, uh, time to cash. Um, so we, we talked a lot about decisioning, and, and decisioning now can be can be pretty quick actually, depending on the on the loan type. 
but you know we need to look at the, at the entire journey um you know you you could be looking at depending on the security type uh time to cash that's measured measured in months but so what's important to, to remember is is the the lending type so your know, lender is only as, as fast as the slowest moving part you know, if there's any security involved um to say that there's some antiqua antiquated uh, elements of, of that journey is, is an understatement um you know this is a panel you think know, talking about business but i just completed on a house purchase a couple of weeks ago it wasn't a complicated purchase there was no restricted covenants it wasn't built into the coal mine um, and yet it took six months. And when you break that down, about four or five months of that was with uh, conveyances, the land registry. It's completely archaic. So you're only as fast as, as the slowest moving part. You know, at Atom, we've we've processed mortgage applications through, um, from a full application to offer in, in 14 seconds. We'd love to get to the point where that's the norm. Um, but other kind of aligned industries need to um, move with us as well. And particularly, I think, when you're looking at um, legal, digital identity, anything that can kind of speed up um that exchange process in both, both businesses and uh, retail customers is really important mm. so i'm going to stay with you then for the follow-up question which is you know how do you how do you, what are the barriers to speeding up that process what are the barriers to digitizing that customer journey yeah and to, to be fair you when you look end to end at the entire journey um I think as an industry and as a kind of broader fintech ecosystem, I think most most elements of it has stepped up to the plate. You know, I think, you know, digital applications, the norm, digital KYC, KYB, decisioning, um, reporting, uh, AML, it's largely all now streamlined and, and automated. Um, it, it, it possibly necessitates at this stage a kind of a broader, you know, particularly for some of those security types, which are a little more complicated broader government um, initiatives and they've been working you know, with the land industry for a while on, on their kind of digital streets program um, something of that kind of ilk is what it's going to take to kind of move the ne needle for um, uh, secured kind of commercial mortgages yeah so I'm gonna stick I'm gonna stick with the, the pain points question um, and move on to Gareth I know when whenever people talk about the SME market and there's a lot of focus on the the s on the small part of that but i mean what are some of the pain points you're seeing with with the with the companies you work with are, are they are they different um than than the than the smaller businesses and what are you seeing with the mid-sized businesses i think that there's similarities in the sense that speed still comes into play but it's not speed in the sense of getting a loan out of the door you know getting a decision in 14 seconds and getting a, a money out of the door in 24 hours for working capital it's much more speed of getting to an indicative price that they can then compare because typically they'll, you know, they'll, they'll be shopping around or, or going through an advisor and we work a lot with the advisor community um, so they'll be shopping around so, so it's getting that indicative price and I think then the other thing is around the, the flexibility um, and, and really understanding their business and how the loan is going to be used and, and what the repayment profile needs to look like it's, it's not a straightforward four-year amortizing loan it, it may be that you know, the first two years are interest only because it's going to take them that long to actually um, become cash flow positive as a result of the loan. So I, I think um, yes, speed and flexibility are the, are the two key things, but it's they're measured in, in slightly different quantum, if you like, to um, to what the the smaller micro end of SME uh, are looking for. <laughs> so they want speed, but they don't they don't need it that fast. Then you're saying yes, exactly. Yes, speed, <laughs> speed but not lightning speed. <laughs> Excellent. More time, more time to do business. Um, so we're, we're, we've got about 10 minutes left of, of our discussion. And I, and I really kind of wanted to, um, unfortunately, talk about COVID, um, you know, which has, which has just, you know, impacted um, economies, businesses, people's personal lives um, all over the world. Um, but a lot of people have talked about the pandemic as almost accelerating a lot of um, innovation uh, especially in the financial services space and of course you know we're gonna we're gathering a lot of data and analytics uh from the global pandemic um i just want to know sort of you know how long it how long is that going to impact the industry you know all of that data all the analytics gained from from this period of time um businesses that are struggling businesses that are surviving businesses that are thriving um how long is that really going to impact the industry. So I'm going to start with Yaren um, here on, on 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 what your views are. So I think I think that um, um, there is a demand for, um, for for money for capital. Um, the demand is always there. I can also also say that uh, if you look on you know on the on the bounce back loans and and the average loan size, 
within the market there is a gap and someone needs to bridge the gap so I, I think that we're going to see really quickly uh, more and more demand coming back um, to the market um, I think that as a result of that um, banks will need to find um, I would say not a better but a new way to evaluate businesses and to be able to react as we said um, to this session to the data and to look for I would call it less traditional a way of evaluating and use the data that was gathered in order to to take um, smarter decisions. Um, I think that one of the things that I can identify is that um, um, there is much more demand for fintech to partner with banks to provide the solution within the right speed, within uh, within the right pace. So I I think that we're going to start and see a fintech joining bank and trying to help bank to to provide this demand and to solve the problems that are. Um, related to the data and the data collection and, 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 and the fact that the, the market is looked totally different right now uh, and once um, the experience that can come from the fintech and the and, and, and the experience that can come from the bank will join together I think that what we're going to see is, is again is, is everything start moving back to normal hmm, interesting so yeah so I'll, I'll move on to Andy uh, to get your views on our on our final question you know how how, how long are we going to feel the impact um, of all the data and analytics that we've gained during during the COVID era? Yeah, it's a, it's a massive question, Liz, and, and a massive unknown, I think, without a, a crystal ball. But I, I think we, we do know that the impacts on SMEs have clearly been significant, as you said in your introduction to this question. Many have been hit incredibly hard, while some have thrived in, in, in this period. Um, as Yaron talked about, I think the, the government loan schemes have also been a massive lifeline for many customers, but that does also create a bit of a challenge as well in understanding what the impacts are going to be longer term. So to what extent have uh, customers taking a bounce back loan or, or a civil, um, uh, are they going to be viable in the uh, in the longer term um, after the, the benefits of that, that loan have, have worn off? What, what I would say though, and I think, I, again, I agree with Yaron here that those businesses who do come out the other end of COVID could be in a really, really strong position to capitalize on what will hopefully be a good period of economic growth. Um, so I think if you can get the right data to determine who to lend to, and that's not easy because it's not necessarily the data we relied on previously to determine who are the right people to lend to, but if you can get that data, there could be some some really great opportunities for, uh, for lenders to help customers and, and really support the, the economic recovery, which I know we're all hopeful we'll, we'll see. Mm, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm worried that that maybe, um, you know, in the in the future, some businesses might be, uh, it, it might look poorly on them that they maybe took out a, a COVID loan, a bounce back loan, but we'll see, we'll see, uh, you know, sort of the, the market uh, attitude going forward. So I'll move on to Gareth now. You know, what are how long do you, all of this, uh, you know, analytics and data that we're gathering right now on, on uh, the the different you know behaviors and survival of, of businesses? How long are we going to feel that that impact? Um, uh, and and how how will we sort of use that data in the future? I think from a pure data perspective, it is almost a silver lining to a recession. I remember uh, when I first started work back in the late 1990s for the first decade of my career. We were almost wishing for a recession because we had no data on what happens when when we go through a recession you know, there just wasn't data around in the early 1990s or the 80s recessions and then of course eventually we got the the 2008 2009 yeah, the financial <laughs> crisis the, the big well we say the big one but actually the impact in terms of small business insolvencies was relatively small and i think probably for decades maybe centuries to come the covid era as, as, as we're calling it will, will almost be seen as the baseline you know and when you're trying to run stress tests and uh, and trying to look at you know, economic scenarios how, you know what's what's the potential downside how bad could things get you can almost measure it in terms of relative to covid because how can anything get worse than this you know what, what no no stress testing ever takes a scenario where huge swathes of the economy simply haven't been able to generate a pound of revenue for months at a time you know that that was just you know, something that no one had ever ever thought of so i think um, you know that this will be a, a really interesting baseline for the extent to which measures taken by government by lenders and, and, and so on can actually mitigate the impact of a recession and, and you can be pretty confident you, know, you almost measure it in terms of is this a 50 percent of covid recession or a 80 percent of covid recession but it, it's not going to be worse than that yeah no i'm glad you brought up that point about you know um 
using this data um, in the future, even though you know we might look at the COVID era as a as not a great time uh, in in our lives. You know, when I, I look back at the the crash of two thousand and eight, one of the problems was that there wasn't a lot of housing data available for crashes, especially in the U.S. You know, having that data available will ho hopefully help us make better decisions in the future. So, so Tom, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna close off our, our discussion with you. So you get, you get the final um, COVID data, silver linings. How long will we use this? How long will this impact our, our industry uh, question? So Tom, I'm gonna go to you. Yeah, I, I think Gauss right. I think you know, the last 12 months have been invaluable in terms of providing a data set that previously just didn't exist. And, you know, even the, the worst case stress scenarios would, would never have envisaged. I think what's perhaps more interesting as well is, is the next 12 months. Actually, what does business recovery look like, um, which would be just as valid. But I, I think if if you if you can um, think back to those kind of pre-pandemic days, you know, these weren't the halcyon days for this. You know, there's still been a, a large and sizable business lending gap, particularly for micro and small businesses. And you know, whilst we've seen kind of Sybils and um, uh, BBLS provide a significant one-off increase um, in the last year, some of those structural gaps haven't been addressed. I think, you know, the, perhaps the worry is that you see some retrenchment trends um, in the next couple of years. But uh, you, know, you look back at the kind of cyclical lockdowns, the business restarts, your lenders have had to monitor um, credit risk with much more limited visibility than they've ever had. Um, and it's represented I think, you know, a fairly compelling opportunity for many of them to digitalize their systems, you know, move away from having historically managed credit risk to a, a future state. You know, a lot being said today about reviewing real time financial data. I think those that have done so and can place data really at the heart of their journeys have a really, you know, um, significant advantage and opportunity to capitalize in, in the years to come. Interesting. No, really interesting. Well, you know, we, uh, data underpins so many, so many financial decisions uh, and 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 part in parts of our lives. Um, I just want to I want to thank our panel, uh, uh, Andy, Yaren, uh, Gareth, and Tom uh, for for our discussion. Um, and stay stay on the main stage for more sessions uh, for Lending 3.0. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.